It's a Monday. I know that for sure. What is it, the 17th? Yeah, month 17th of April, 2017. Let's start our uh, daily Forex trading strategy session, huh? Let's get her done, done, done. So good morning. Welcome to Forex. Today, let me remind you that trading is risky, not appropriate for everyone. Your past performance, however, good or bad, is not necessarily indicative of future results. Could have been a hero yesterday and a zero today. Always keep that in mind. So trade small, be humble, focus on the long term, and never risk money you cannot afford to lose. My name is Wayne McDonald. I'm the Chief FX Market Strategist for TradersWay.com. been doing this a very long time, and I'm here to share my experience with you, the hopes of helping you become a success as a currency trader. I'm not, I can't really help you with your salsa dancing, being Canadian and all, um, but I can help you trade. Oh, Albert finally uh, funded his account at TradersWay.com. Right on, Albert. Welcome to the family. I do these sessions every day, 7.30 in the morning, Monday through Friday, here at Forex.today. Except for first Fridays of the month, you'll find me at FX Street, where I've been doing webinars for 12 years, something like that, 12, 13 years, maybe. That's a long time in the Forex world, at least retail Forex. So uh, uh, questions are, are encouraged. Let me know how it can help. You can show your loyalty and respect by funding an account like Albert did at tradersway.com. Yeah, Charles, I apologize for that. There's something, it's for those that have clicked on uh, follow. There was an update to the site, and it's triggered a little something, something somewhere. And so you're getting updates about posts that were made two years ago. We're trying to figure out how to turn that sucker off. So we did have someone work all Easter weekend trying to figure it out. They just haven't been very successful at doing it. So I apologize for that. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, that's all I can say. I'm getting swamped too, but we're trying to figure it out. Yeah. So it's me. It's not you, baby. It's me. All right. So where are we? Well, this is gold. You guys want to just start? Let's jump right in, cold start. Here, actually, you know what? Let's not just jump in cold start. Life is great. Life is grand. Whoa. There it is. Life is great. Life is grand. Life is good. What I wanted to do was go to news. COT report. Boy, I didn't click on that, right? Okay. 
cool. You know what? On this PC, I haven't installed the drawing tool. I guess I should get get that going sometime. All right, so this goes all the way back to April 10. Yeah, that looks correct. Cool. So this is the commitment of Trader's Report. And it is a report of open, large open positions by institutional investors. And then that could be broken down into two subcategories. Bonafide hedgers, which is actually um, a category of taxation in the United States. So if you are a bona fide hedger, you're in the market to hedge, you're not uh, taxed, uh, or let's say you're taxed differently and more appropriately for someone that is not actually trying to make money, because you may you might have made money hedging, but you therefore you would have lost money somewhere else. You see what I mean? So the government separates you over there, and you have to declare yourself a hedger and all that kind of stuff and qualify. Great. Right? So you put those guys over there. Then you have all the other reportable positions, and these are large positions. So you have everything that's reported, right? Large hedging, move that aside, and then you're left with large non-hedging, <clears throat> otherwise known as speculative. And then anything else, volume-wise, that's out there that's not a hedger, and not a speculator, is simply not large money that would be the small retail traders and therefore you could derive who everybody is smart money dumb money and everybody else cool right so anyways these are large reportable positions aka institutional positions in the marketplace not a survey of what you would like to do or how you feel what do you think about this this is actual money in the market by institutional investors that are in the market to make money that are not hedgers okay so that's why we want to look at this let me get a drawing tool going here beep 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 all right so the first thing uh, we can look at here is the dark uh the dark gray line this stuff okay this represents buyers okay the second thing that you should look at is sort of the bluer line okay oops and then it kicks up here at the end those are sellers all right so let me clear that out now there was a small increase in in buyers there was also an increase in sellers. The increase in sellers was slightly larger than the increase in buyers. So volume went up and just ever so slightly more bulls and uh, more bears entered the market than bulls. And we're essentially on the euro dollar neutral. So this zero area means that there's up okay, we're very close to the same amount of bulls and bears in the market. There's just slightly a little bit more bears, but I wouldn't make a big stink about that. So the market is neutral. Knowing that, how do you think the market will behave? Yeah. Well, it'll let, let's just put it in there. Uh, let's change the thought. What if the market was extremely, extremely bullish? Well, you, if it's extremely, extremely, extremely bullish and price runs up to like a monthly pivot point or a ginormous psych level, you face the risk of that market very quickly taking profit and the entire market collapsing on you very quickly and it's usually quite quickly because what happens is it builds up builds up builds up avalanche just like that 
right? Just think of an avalanche where you're staring at the top of the mountain and the snow is hanging, and more and more snow is hanging, more and more snow is hanging, more and more snow is hanging, more and more snow. You know, it, it's it's bullish. It's long on snow. Do you understand? <laughs> it's long on snow. And then one day, it just cracks, and boom, down she comes. And what happens is it hits, it loosens more snow, which loosens more snow, which loosens more snow, which loosens more snow, and it's, it's exponential. Actually, it would be a geometric series, huh? Wouldn't it? Anybody good at math? I, I'm real good. What is it? How would you, how would you draw that? What, uh, over uh, how many time periods? It wouldn't be infinite, right? So let's, it might be a one shot, but it would increase infinitely. T over one minus T times something, right? Times... Uh, the rate at which it, exp it grabs other levels. No, you'd have to. Equals avalanche. <laughs> I don't know. Equals sound. I don't know. Uh, this would be the. I guess this would have to do with the slope and everything, and you'd have to figure out the rate in which it would take more snow. So I think you'd need to know how much snow there is, the slope of the mountain. Some other things be able to figure it out. But anyways, a geometric series of some sort. Uh, yeah. So anyways, uh, so we're back to this neutral. And I wouldn't expect a ginormous move one way or the other. And some of you guys said neutral and other people say sideways or range. I think a little bit more range where if you're a bull and you're at hardcore support, and the key word there is hardcore, you should look to buy it. If you're a bear and you're at hardcore resistance, you, you should look to sell it. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade a neutral market when technically it's also neutral. You're, you're in the middle of support resistance. Michael says it sounds like a Fibonacci problem. Actually, it wouldn't be, right? Because it grows proportionally, right? Right? One, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one. 34, 55, 89, 144, 50, right? That kind of stuff. Like it's growing that way, but ex, but an exponential geometric series would be more like um, 1, 1, 2, 4, 8, right? 16, so it's growing faster already, 16. And then we're over here, all right, 32. 64, right? And it's getting bigger and bigger and faster and faster and carrying so much snow. And then I think it would probably end in a reverse geometric series, right? Yeah, he was definitely a math guy. Um, and uh, who was his buddy? The guy that figured out uh, octaves have to do with, uh, like, to change an octave from, from one C to the next C, you simply have half the string. What was that guy's name? The, um, oh, I can't think of the 
guy's name. Anyways, there's he was a buddy with another math guy. What was that guy's name? Hmm. Well, it's too early in the morning for such stuff. Someday, when you're all alone and your world is cool, you will be thinking of me. Okay, pig dog. So you could just skip everything and just jump to the black line. Okay, is it is the market bullish or bearish on the British pound? Yes, Ryan's got it too. Net bearish. Sounds sounds a lot better because bearish might be an opinion. Hey, is the market bullish or bearish? Ah, oh, it's bearish. You say, well, when analyzing the open speculative positions through the commitment of traders report as released by the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, I can tell you the exact number of open positions, both long and short, and the market is net bearish. It just sounds better. Net meaning you add up all the all of these contracts with all of these contracts, and there are more, right? So, right, these are the short positions you see way up here. So we're short. Uh, we're short 125,000 contracts, maybe a little more than that. Let me get this up here. Okay. And then down here, right, significantly less, 50,000. Now, the other thing you look at is the amount of bears have been coming down over the last month or so. The last week was interesting because there was an uptick. A few more bears are maybe thinking about getting in, maybe. Maybe thinking about getting in, maybe. And yet, the bullish side hasn't changed at all. Nobody's been buying this market for quite some time. Now, uh, a couple of months ago, you could see some of the bulls got out of the market and they have not come back. So, as the pound dollar has been going up and down recently, you could see it had to do with people shorting. People taking profit on their shorts. And now maybe thinking about perhaps shorting again. So notice that the pound has had quite a recovery, but it's not people buying it. I know you just got gray matter all over your keyboard. Yeah, the pound has been going up versus the dollar, but not because people were buying it. Ozzy, look at this disaster, huh? What a disaster, huh? Okay, what is going on here? First of all, look at the net. The market has been bullish. Look back here. In January, the market was neutral. Then bullish, 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 bullish. Till about March. And then down, down, up, 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 down, down, up, up, down. So it's been moving sideways since March. It had a nice run. 
over the last three weeks, uh, it's been coming down. So the question is, why has it been coming down? Significantly less bulls. You see how many bulls got out of the market last week? Oy vey, huh? Look at that. And then the, the baby blue, the light blue here. Significantly less bears. Right, significantly less bears than we used to have. So the market is still extremely net positive. There are more buyers in the market than there are bears. In fact, there are less bears week over week. Okay. But over the last couple of months, it's basically been sideways as far as volume is concerned. Remember, we're talking about volume. The number of contracts actually open. So that's Aussie, huh? So th do you think it's going to go bullish again? Well, this dark blue happens to be the price. So you can see there was something going on here. What do you think? It's possible, isn't it? I think if you're already a bull, you'd have to be thinking about something like that, no? So there's your Aussie. And I think it's these times when the markets are hesitating for like four, five, six weeks. Remember, uh, retail traders get caught up in their 15 minute and one hour charts, right? And they're like, this is, hasn't done anything for four weeks. This thing hasn't done anything for five weeks. But I think you should be looking for that. Do I still have sound? Yeah, yeah, looks like I'm broadcasting here. Seems like the same problem as my old PC before it blew up. That was a Windows 7 thing where, anyways, we'd just be running around and it's like flash or something all of a sudden just bombs out. Yeah, I can't change. It's the browser, I believe. So it's Flash. It's like... Something as simple as that, huh? Yeah, it's the camera software, it looks like. 
All right, well, we'll just reset this for time, time if we have to. So please confirm you have your charts back. Cool, thank you very much. All right, so this is our friend called Gold. And what's been happening with gold? Well, let's take a look. Ah, I swear I changed this. It's yellow, yeah. It says I've selected red. All right, well, let's try it again, see if it works. There you go. Okay, down, up, down, up. At this point, you're bullish. Because this high is higher than the previous high. It's just it. Okay. Not a very good entry, but plausibly goes up. Okay. This is the counter trend trade we had that week. Remember how we hit the weekly target on Monday? That predicts a counter trend trade back to the central, which it did. Great. Now it can get you a reasonable buy. So this Monday, right here, on that particular week, we're in a buy zone. And the target is the red zone, which it did. All right? Cool. Then last week, it opens up in the buy zone, which you, the target is the red zone, which it hit. and went a little above that. That's your call if you're that brave or stupid to stay in it all the way through Friday. That's your call. And now look at the interesting scenario that we're in. It's interesting because this area that you're looking at, come on, drawing tool, there you go. This area up here, oops, is the monthly target, the monthly red zone. Just like those weekly ones. We're, we're right at the monthly M4 and below the monthly R2. So that is the target for this month. Okay, it's not supposed to go higher. We're simply supposed to hit it. Now it could go a little higher into the R2, but nonetheless, this is the take profit zone. Okay. So even though it's not the end of April, this is where you should take the vast majority of your profit and walk away. Okay? And that's that. It's neat. So even though it might go higher, might is not part of your vocabulary, is it? Did somebody pay you a lot of money and have you risk millions and millions and millions of their dollars if you were not if if you were not opinionated, meaning you say things like, "Well, it might go up, I don't really know." <laughs> right? Well, it might go up. I don't really know. It could go up. Yeah, it might go up. Yes, it is, Peter. Totally standard. It's not me making the decision. That's just how you trade. So I look at this. I'm like, that's the top of the month. I'm done. Not even an opinion. So my opinion has to do with if it goes higher than $1,300.26, if it goes higher than that, it's uh, risky pips, or pennies in this case, right? So even if I was a bull, I'd have to be cautious. So for example, let me just throw something out there. Like if it did, uh, if it did something like this, like let's say we broke through it and we were up in here, okay? Now that's a weekly target, and I would still assume 
a drop like this, even though we're above. I would assume that we're just going to like, like a turtle, stick our neck out of the shell, which is dangerous, and it gets chopped off, and then boom, back around we come. Okay, so this is all dangerous. So don't be a turtle. You stick your neck out. It's dangerous. All right. So anyway, so that's pretty interesting. So gold to me isn't, it's not that it's overbought. It's just, uh, you know, I would say it doesn't have a lot more room to appreciate in value at this time. I mean, let's say gold is worth $1,400 an ounce. We're only at $1,300 an ounce. So someone might say, well, Wayne, it's 100, you know, it'll appreciate another $100. So someone might just buy it and hold it for a year until it gets to $1,400. I say, well, that's great. Good. Good for you. My job would be to build up a position to have it go up to $1,200 over time right and in that case i could say well yes it has appreciated the market is bullish but at the moment it's not a good deal if i thought it could in the next let's say week or so come down again then that would be a better time to buy it so you know i'd rather buy it at 1250 than 1300 let's say So whatever, it's up there. Okay, gold is up there. Thirteen hundred bucks is, I think, going to be a challenge. If now, if you're a bear, you might want to sell thirteen hundred. Wow, looks like my I've fixed this about six times already, haven't I? All right. Cool. So oil didn't go up enough to sell didn't fall enough to buy get rid of that okay so it really comes down to whether you're a bull or a bear on this if you're a bull you should have bought it not long ago i mean this is a buy zone seems to me if you had i don't know eyeballs and you were a bull you would have seen this as support and in here, this whole area here is a buy zone. Okay. This whole area, if you were a bull, okay, if you were a bull and it was Sunday or Monday morning, Sunday night, Monday morning, whenever the market opens for you. This is what you would have been doing. You would have said, well, somewhere in here I want to buy. You know that. Okay. And then you say, oh, well, I have support here and here and here. You know, so if it comes down into there, I'm going to look to buy it. Anyone that took my swing trading course knows this to be a, a factual statement. Okay. If you were there, something similar occurred up in here, okay, where this area up in here is a sell zone. Okay. Especially when you take all that into account. Once again, the way that you earn your supper is simply to decide whether you should be bullish or bearish. Okay, So if you might advise your client, let's say, and your client might be you, but still, if you can't explain it, then it's not much of a strategy. Okay, You might say something like this is going on. OK. 
Okay. And you know your target is weekly M1. Okay. And because we opened up so low, it may actually be S2. Okay. Now, if you've already analyzed all of this, it means you're an oil trader. You're an opinionated oil trader, which is another way of saying that you're an expert in energy. Okay. That's it. And experts get tend to get paid more than laymen. Now, as a, you know, it might be you, okay. Also, as an expert in energy, you might not be bearish, but you might be bullish. Okay. Right, so there are two ways to play it then. You also see the trend line. Okay. But you're going to play it like this. So you could either buy it now off support. Oops, I guess it'll work. Okay. Or you're going to have a plan like that. And what amateurs do is they don't make decisions. They're not a bull or a bear. So they wait for a setup. They wait for it to hit support or resistance. They wait for it to already happen, right? And then they get in unbelievably late. And it's because they don't know what's going on and they're making decisions late, right? And then what? The stops are too close, the time frames are too small. So what happens is they buy here. The reason they buy here is, look, it went up for the last nine hours straight so now i'll buy it and then it comes down they're like oh my god i'm losing 30 cents get out get out get out and what they do is they sell their long position here right and then it they wait till it comes up here and then what do they do because you know now it's bullish, and you're like, I knew it was going to be bullish, but I lost money, right? So on and so forth. So they buy it up here, not knowing it's a pivot, and people take profit, right? All right, so once again, make decisions. Bears are thinking this, okay? Bulls are thinking the opposite. So a bull would want to buy here. You know, I think a bear actually would be happy to sell this here at the M2 or at the M3. Okay. So remember, you're thinking many candles ahead, you're, right? You're thinking many candles ahead. You need to be waiting. Most of Forex, actually, more in trading, and I suppose even investing, right? Most of trading and investing is waiting. If you're not waiting, it's because you don't have a plan. Well, what's your plan? I don't know, but charge! <laughs> what's your plan today? Kill them all! <laughs> yes. <laughs> For Sparta! <laughs> yeah, and then... Yeah. Yeah, pull the trigger. Bring the wrong ammunition, huh? So anyways, um, so the plan should be, if you are a bull, look for the levels of support. If you're a bull and it breaks below this area, you're down here, let's say, what are you going to do?
Probably nothing. <laughs> it, it, it's such a relief to have a plan and a strategy. You're like, oh, man, it broke below my support. Hmm. I guess I better back off, right? You're like, whoa, gee whiz. And you're done. And if you're a bull and you find yourself up here, a weekly M3, then you're like, oh, well, if it drops back to the central, I'll buy it again. Which means my stop should be near break even by that point. On well, my first trade. And if you're a bear, you're thinking, man, if this turns south, right around $53.62, I'm going to have to take a shot there. And the target is M1. So even if you're a bull or a bear, you know it's going to come down at $53.65. If you did your job. But imagine the person that bought it down in here. Oh, but Wayne, you know, I only had like 12 hours to get ready for the support in my buy zone. It's too quick, Wayne. Only 12 hours. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, uh, are the socialist pig dog Europeans um, on holiday today? I think the markets might be closed, right, for the socialist pig dog Europeans? Yeah. What about tomorrow? Sweden is a full holiday. No, no, no. Ryan says they're open tomorrow. No, no, no. But the French are going to strike. Because you have to follow up a long weekend with a strike. So, I mean, it's just, I don't know. I think it's also French law. I mean, you have to, right? So, but there are... What are we striking for? Cigarette. <laughs> Good. All right. All right. Let's take a look. This is Noki. Noki, Noki, Noki. So we watched this one last week. I set it up for you the week before, but this was one that we did watch last week. And we thought this was very interesting that it opened up Monday at M3. So what is the target that we knew would, well, we don't know. What was the planned target based on that top last week on Sunday morning or Sunday evening slash Monday morning? M1. This is the conservative target right here. So we said it would drop to 8.55. Cool. Oh my gosh. So lucky, right? Lucky again. Just amazing coincidence that back here on Monday, you said if that holds and this market falls, it's going to fall. To that price right there. <laughs> You're like, oh, right, it's not perfect, right? You're like, it's not perfect. It's only 97% accurate because it did go a little higher. It did go a little lower. You're like, well, Wayne, 
three percent tolerance is intolerable. That's just sloppy. All right. So now what? Well, this is a dangerous proposition. Now, first of all, if you're a bear, this is your cell zone. And oh boy, did you get close to that this morning. So I would treat this as a central pivot touch. Okay. Because it, it also kicked off the 200, which is a reset, right? which means your target is actually 8.45 S2. Oh, snap. Noki's on fire. Which means maybe uh, North Sea oil prices are going to go up this week. So now you'd have to revisit that oil, right? That oil chart. And just assume WTI is going to go along with it. Or the dollar is going to collapse today, or something to that effect, right? Any questions about that? What if you were a bull? Well, bulls buy at support, so let's look at this. This was support, and then resistance, and then resistance, and then support. And, oh, snap, that's where we are now? Off of last week's target? What if the bears give up? What if the touch of the 200 is not aggressive reset but neutrality? Well, then a bull is going to have a plan like this, yo. And that's just as valid, except we're at an entry right now. Okay? That is the M2 predicting an M4. So again, you're like, Wayne, why don't you just tell me what to do? Uh, I, I am you what to do. I just told you what a bull would do and what a bear would do. I don't know if you're a bull or a bear. Okay, so there's the bullish target, there's the bearish target. Okay, remember, this is the bearish target because green to me means up. So if it's fallen this far, it's not likely to fall further. It, in fact, it's likely to bounce up. If it's risen this far, it's not likely to rise further, so it would fall. Okay, red meaning down, green meaning up. So if you're a bear, you're aiming down to where you should take profit. If you're a bull, you're aiming up to where you should take profit. And so when I actually picked up these colors and everything, you know, 11 or 12 years ago when I had it all custom made for the deal book before pivot points were available to any trading platform in the world, I had them programmed. I picked up these colors. I made up these areas, in fact, because I didn't read anything in a rule book. And I called them pivot profit zones. Right? I mean, I wrote my book, what, 2008? Well, no, it was published 2008, so I wrote it 2007, or which means I've been doing this since, I don't know, 2002? Right, which is longer than anybody. So I can tell you where all this came from, just through observation. Hojo, no, now every idiot on the planet can get this. So, but I'm telling you where it came from. So I did buy a, a course on pivot points. I think it was on eBay, and you get a book and a DVD, and he didn't tell you what pivot points were. He didn't tell you how to calculate them because you had to pay like a $300 a month fee, and he would calculate the pivot points for you every day. No weekly or monthly at that time. 
And so that you were hooked into the service. And of course, you know, you get the book and the book is just like photocopied out of, you know, Kinko's. It was just crap. And he said, yeah, you know, I forget what his buy and sell zones were. And they, he might have been more of a counter trender thinking about it. These might have been like sort of buy here and sell up here, which is really ridiculous. But but anyways, but he had this thing. He said it was pivot points were like flying an airplane. So if you sold where he told you to sell and you were losing money, he said, no, 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 no it's OK. Just turn them upside down. So if you were losing a ton of money because his strategy told you to sell, then stop selling and just start buying. <laughs> I like that makes no sense because by the time you stop selling where his strategy told you to sell and you flipped and you just started buying instead, you've already lost most of your money and now you're just adding insult to injury and I'm like, this is stupid. I read it on a vacation, and I just threw it away. I'm like, that is the last time I'm going to buy some other course, because that was just stupid. So, but I end up paying attention to pivots, and uh, where did I even get the formula? I don't even remember now. But I, I hired a programmer for the deal book. You know, in 2004 or something, 2005, some guy, and he, he made it in the CTL language, I think it was, and uh, popped it in, and it slowly evolved into something like this. Now, you know, every idiot on the planet uses something like this before, but I'm telling you, it didn't exist when I learned how to trade. So Hoto says uh, yours display differently from mine. Well, you might be using a different pivot point indicator. There are millions, so find one you like. All right, so Peter says, how do you determine to put more emphasis on FIB retracements and extensions versus pivot points, midpoints? Okay. All right, first of all, you're asking me two different things. So it's like, you know, hey, Wayne, I want to go to Home Depot and buy 50 bags of mulch. Should I take the Lamborghini <laughs> or the Ford F-150? Like, well, let's just say those vehicles are used for two different things. You'd probably be better off at the Ford F-150. But, you know, you could put it in a Lamborghini, I suppose, right? So, a FIB, all it's measuring is the, how do you say, like a rate, the rate of a trend? Okay. 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 So, all you're measuring is the rate or strength of a trend, really comes down to strength really okay so you're measuring this okay that's all you're measuring and then you're paying attention to how far it pulls back before the trend resumes okay 3A2, 50%, or 618. If it's 3A2, it's a very, very strong trend, and it's assumed to extend further because it's very bullish. There was a slight retracement, 
and then more bulls got on board. And, okay. And then there's another retracement. 3A2, 50%. Six one eight. Okay, and because it pulled back more, that indicates that some of the bulls from earlier took profit, and there are less bulls. But it's still very bullish, and it should extend. But this extension may be less than the previous extension because it's bullish. We just might not have all the bulls on this, so it extends up and pulls back. And once again, we measured the three A two. 50%, a 618, and now in this case, a 786. Now it's pulled back a lot, which means even more bulls got out of this market. And because it's a 786, we need to be very, very ready for the potential of a double top because the, the bulls that didn't get out the first time suffered through almost an 80% retracement and are going to be very happy. I mean, in fact, they're sitting at the computer praying, please let it go back up, and I promise you I'll take profit. Okay. And then, you know, and then reversals. Okay. This has nothing to do with pivot points. They're not even related. So you're like, well, how do you know which one do you? Well, they're two different things, right? You should be asking me, like, if you're worried about what holds the most amount of tonnage, you should compare a Dodge Ram pickup truck with a Ford F-150, not my Lamborghini. I'm like, a Lamborghini? It's it's a weird question. What do you mean? We'll focus on more. You know, that's like saying, well, which indicator works better? Well, I'll tell you what. You plug an algorithm into your charts, it will work perfect, a hundred percent every single time, because all they are is algorithms, right? So you just have to understand what they're measuring. So this measures trend. All right. Well, what if the trend is sideways? Are you using Fibonacci? No, because there's no trend. Okay, so it's just simply measuring sort of the strength of a trend. A strong trend should be making small retracements. A weak trend will be making large retracements. Okay, and then as far as targets like Fibonacci extensions, ah, they're guidelines. They're they're like soft targets. But you should be making your decisions not on just pure technical technicals. I mean, look, if you made decisions on fundamentals, you wouldn't have a target. There's just sort of a guide, right? But your decision should be made on more than Fibonacci. Because here's, here's what most successful amateur traders do. They get out early. They're like, well, Wayne, I'm working 12 hours a day. 70% of my trades are winners. I'm just not making much money. So eventually, then they get frustrated with that, and they just decide to jack up the leverage because, hey, man, 70% of their winners, right? And all of a sudden, boom, the 30% takes them down, and they're out of they're out of trading. So you know you got to So the extensions are more like soft targets, but if they overlap other soft targets. Together, maybe they make a harder target, right? But just consider them a guide. Now, pivot points, they don't measure trends. They measure markets. They're support and resistance. Okay? So if Fibonacci says, well, if this is a 50%, then this should rise, right? And if that's such and such, all right? So let, maybe I can combine some of these on these actual charts now. Okay, so this pivot predicted this top, okay, all right, 
this pivot predicted this top, so on and so forth. But your Fibonacci is measuring this to this, right? Maybe even that. So I don't know. I'm tired of talking about it. So anyways, pivots are support and resistance in the market. They have nothing to do with trend. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you may want to consider taking this the swing course that extensively talks about pivot points, both weekly and monthly. And so for that, you'd go to fxbootcamp.com. Now, Fred says small profits, uh, big losses. Yeah, well, that's that's amateur amateur. But I, I think I said successful amateurs. And that's where they, they get to the point where they're not taking any blood baths anymore. They're not making stupid trades and they're not chasing. They're working really, really, really hard. And even though they're successful, they're not filthy, stinking rich, right? So I did a whole video years ago on how to get filthy, stinking rich with the Forex. But let me just tell you, it has to do with letting the profits run. So Peter, again, is trying to mix. He says, well, what if there's a 3A2 retracement, but a midpoint, blah, blah. They're totally two different things. Right? You're speaking Spanglish to me, man. Half the time you're speaking Spanish, half the time you're speaking English, and I don't know what the heck's going on. I don't know if you're asking for directions or, or asking for money. I, I don't know. <laughs> They're two different things, right? So the reason I came up with it seems like everybody, okay, I love that part. Everybody talks about a fib extension. Level should be viewed as support and resistance. No. All right, just stop listening to everybody, Peter. There's me and your mother, and your mother doesn't make you money. Yeah. So everybody's stupid, right? Just remember that. Yeah, and your hairless dog. Everybody's stupid. Well, not everybody. 95% of everybody in this market, right? Because we know 95% fail, right? So, uh, so everybody's stupid, right? That's it. So right off the bat, everybody's stupid. And that's why I don't care about other people's opinions. That one bad experience with pivot points, uh, that course I bought, it was just a copy of the course, but, you know, from, I don't know, a long time ago. It was just dumb. I realized that guy was just trying to scam me out of my money. So it just comes down to you need to listen to yourself, all right, before you even look at fibs. Like, how about this? Get rid of your Fibonacci. Let's just do that. Let's simplify things. I'm a big fan of fib, but, you know, like, you're confusing two things. So let's get rid of a couple. Uh, let's get rid of half your problem. Stop doing Fibonacci completely. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, right? I appreciate it, Peter. So, like, literally, get rid of it. Stop using it. You can you can bring it back next year once you figure out the pivot points. Let's do it that way, All right? Because you're you're mixing up two tools that tell you two different things. You're like, well, what if this says this, and what if says well, they're both right. That's the part. And my my guess is you're also probably using uh, your Fibonacci at wrong times as well. And if you're doing things like using, you know, an extension as resistance to bring, oh, I could, I mean, somebody's pushing you somewhere. And there probably is somebody that you, you've taken a webinar with that probably does use Fibonacci that way and is probably successful that way. Um, and they're, you know, they're overlapping these things with other things that inevitably are the real thing. So, for example, you know, a Fibonacci extension that's overlapping the psych level? Well, think of it this way. What percentage of the market can, can see that psych level? Let's say um, USD yen is at 
10 cents, right? A dollar 10. What percentage of the market can see the USD yen at 110? What percentage? Yeah, okay, 100%. What percentage of the market sees your Fibonacci extension of 261.8%? Well, they would have to know that what what precise thing you're measuring, but the market can't see you. You see what I mean? Yeah. Okay. If another trader happens to have made the same fib drawing and cares about that fib extension to the same degree that you do. Yeah, yeah, objectivity over subjectivity. Yes, well, put it this way. Nobody cares about your fib extension except you. And if it went up to the psych level, why did the market drop or rise, whatever the case may be? Why did the market react? Because of your fib extension or because it's a psych level? Right? Because it's a psych level. So nobody actually can. Right? So if somebody did this. Uh, it does, I thought that would even work. It doesn't even work. Um, oops. I'm trying to. I eyeballed it and I thought that was going to work. I'm not even going to be able to find an example on this chart. <laughs> yeah, so I can't even find an example. But here's the thing. All right, so we need to simplify, and you're doing analysis paralysis. And I think part of it is because you're, you're probably not using the, the tools correctly. And you, I think you might be listening to too many people as well. So, um, all right, so let's just do this. Stop using Fibonacci altogether. I'm going to assume you know how to use it, okay? You know the, the retracement. You obviously get the extension part, but it's leading to confusion with analysis of other, other tools, all right? Okay, cool. So stop using Fibonacci for a while. If, Three months from now, four months from now, five months from now, whenever you think you're ready, you can bring you can bring back your fit. But I'll tell you what, from June to August, the market is not likely to trend, and you shouldn't use your fibs anyways, unless you're using very small time frames. You're not likely to see any trends, and therefore you wouldn't use a trending tool in a sideways, low volume, low volatility market. So. You could probably put them away and just say, I'm not even going to use fibs until September. But understanding that you understand them, you can bring them back when you feel like you need them. Okay. So from now on, I want you to use pivot points and just see, right? See how they help you identify support and resistance. I also want you to identify support and resistance visually. Because what I teach people is that there's two types of support and resistance. One of price, where you say, well, this was a lower high, this is a lower low, right? Right? This is something, this is something, right? You're doing this visually, okay? You're just looking at things visually, identifying support and resistance, and they may become important in the future. Okay. And then, okay, that's price action support and resistance. 
right? So for example, here, right? This support here was that resistance there. This resistance here is resistance in here, okay? This support here became support here, the support here, okay? So on and so forth, right? So you get very good at this kind of stuff. That's identifying support and resistance with uh, price action. Okay. And of course, the reason for that is you can see, right, it became support again, right, and then broke out, and then the resistance became support, and it broke out, came back to this support, which is just this again. Back up in here, which might just be this resistance again. And then you can see there was support here in the past. You know, so all this kind of stuff, right? So you get really good at that. And then pivot points are support and resistance based on what happened in the market last month, last week, yesterday, depending on what pivots you're using. Okay. No. Uh, I mean, does do psych? Well, actually, the answer is yes, but I wouldn't focus on it at the moment if I was Peter because we're trying to simplify. If Peter used weekly pivot points between now and September, there's probably 20 weeks of opportunity to get better at pivots. Okay. Right. And then we could always reincorporate things that work well back in the past. You know, we can bring that forward. But more important than Fibonacci is support and resistance. Because Fibonacci only works in a trending market. The market very often does not trend. But support and resistance is always important. You got it? So that's where I would start. I would focus in and just say, well, you've already mastered Fibonacci. Great. Good. Put it in the toolbox, master pivots, which is just another form of mastering support and resistance of the market. Uh, another thing that you might want to master along with Fibonacci is price action. Right? And once you get price action down, you'll say, oh, my God, this is basically Elliott Wave. And I thought Elliott Wave was a genius, but it, it's basic elementary support or uh, price action with some basic elementary Fibonacci tools. You're like, oh, my God, maybe he wasn't a genius. So anyways, got to keep an eye on the time. time is it? Oh my god, I'm well past. Oh, sorry about that guys. We went uh we went too long today. I probably started a little bit late anyways, my PC was slow. So anyways, well, I'm already looking forward to tomorrow. So I hope to see you tomorrow. But I appreciate the interactivity. I appreciate your questions and comments and appreciate the effort that you make um, to be a successful trader. Uh, I ask you once again to post on Forex.today one trade plan or more every day. And the reason for it is it means you have a plan. And I don't know why so many of you delay your uh, destiny. You're here because you want to be a success as a currency trader. And then you log out of the webinar and you disappear. And then you'll come back tomorrow, log in, and you just don't put in the work ethic. I don't understand. We have something in common where we like trading. But then we, then we diverge. And I work at it hard all day. And I don't know what you do. Right? So... 
once once again, I I hope you put together a trade plan, at least one, and post it every single day at Forex Start Today, because it will help you become a success. You know. You understand? Like it's so important, and yet maybe ten percent of you actually do it. So what? I don't know what the other ninety percent do, except be part of the ninety percent that fail. I I guess I don't, but I don't know. That's the part I don't understand. So, anyways, please post and also leave comments for each other. Help each other out. Be part of a team. Be part of a family. So, anyways, peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May your profits be above average. And I will see you tomorrow. Yes, I'll upload this as long as I don't have problems with YouTube or this thing or the other thing. Take care, y'all. Take care, y'all.